welcome to Tanakh Talk. I am your host, William Hall, broadcasting live out of Kingsland, Texas, USA, with episode number 20 of Testimony Tuesday's special event today, doing it on Sunday, out of the ordinary, but this is an extraordinary guy, and so this is perfectly fitting. Welcome to the screen, uh, Rabbi Yaron Reuven. Uh, such a, such a, uh, uh, just an awesome, awesome. I, I have to start this whole thing off by just saying, uh, I watched your testimony, your full testimonial video, and it was a long video. And in my opinion, it was too short. I could have listened to that. I could, I, I just had like, I could have taken every 10 minute section and asked you to expound on each 10 minute section for another hour or two. It was just amazing. Absolutely amazing. Awesome. Such a delight. Awesome. And uh, uh, it's it's definitely a unique story. Most of the testimonies that, that, that I do are, are really people who are just simply in Christianity as a child, grow up Christians, and then they leave. But, but you've got a unique story, one I've never heard of before. And more importantly, one I've uh, a story that I think, uh, Rabbi, uh, that I've been wanting to hear of, uh, the whole thing about money and who do you choose, God or money, you know? And so, uh, everybody, this is uh, Rabbi Yaron. You, would you like to tell, uh, just introduce yourself? And, uh, uh, sure. sure. Well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for having me on the show. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge honor for me because I've actually been watching your work for some time now. Oh, wow. Uh, I also, I already... Um, I got familiar with actually uh, with you through Rabbi Tobias Singer, which I started following him uh, back, uh, I think, towards the beginning of my journey, my Chuva story uh, back, I'd say, uh, towards the end of 2012. Um, my, uh, my rabbi, Rabbi Ephraim Kachlon, uh, told me, listen, there's an uh, English-speaking rabbi that uh, his whole mission is to debunk Christianity. You should look into it. So uh, I got familiar with him, and then little by little, eventually got to uh, your work, and I've been actually watching your show as often as I can. Oh, Hashem, we've been very busy over the last uh, couple of years doing Kirub, so I have less time to watch videos than I'd like to, but every time <laughs> I get a chance to, I, I, I do, and actually watched your uh, recent movie, recent uh, video you made uh, the whole move with the, um, with the office, with the studio. So oh, that's really uh, cool. That's really cool. For me, for, for somebody like me that's in it also, it, it's very impressive because it shows the level of dedication that somebody has to their work. Uh, sure. That's something you always want to be a part of. So, Baruch Hashem, thank you for having me. Well, I'll tell you what, it is definitely my pleasure, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. I've had several people ask me if I know you, and uh, and both of you know both of the most recent ones would say, well, if you don't, you, you need to know this guy. You need to know this guy. And that's why I kind of reached out to you. And, uh, and then we reached out to each other, and then finally time made it so that we could do today. And so I think it's going to be a great, <clears throat> I think you're going to be a fantastic uh, addition to the Tanakh Talk Network. That is for sure, That's because sure. it's... Uh, That's sure. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So, uh, so anyway, I want to let everybody know that the phone lines are indeed open. If you have any questions along the way, uh, feel free to call in. Let me see if I can find the phone number that I put in here usually. There it is right there. I'll put that on your screen right now. Uh, so... Yeah, so definitely call in uh, as we're going along and uh, say hi to the rabbi and ask him whatever question you've got on your mind about his journey. But uh, so for now, all, all I'm going to do is I'm going to um, I'm going to kind of base my random questions uh, off off your main video, and then we'll we'll put a link somewhere uh, after the video. In fact, that's what I'll do. I'll actually embed a link uh, to your full testimony. Uh, at the end of this video, so once everybody's completely watched it on the very tail end of it, uh, there'll be a link they can click on and actually watch it. And you got to watch it. I mean, it can be ten hours and it's still too short. Trust me, it's just a really great story. So, um, so let's get, we'll get going with this. So, um, so going back to <clears throat> my my previous statements, you know, I, I've never heard anybody who has uh, has had quite this particular journey that you've got. I mean. Uh, your just just even the whole money thing and how you were like so deep into Wall Street and um, I, I would like for you to give uh, maybe even throw a few spoiler alerts to your actual testimony. Tell us a few highlights of your testimony. Uh, and of course, that's the whole reason for today anyway is to kind of do a highlight and we'll refer them back to the main video after this one so they can see it. Sure. Sound good? Go ahead. Uh, sure, sure. Uh, okay. I mean, in, to summarize it in a simple sentence, it's the the story. I guess as a, um, it has to do with, you know, get, going from nothing to something. You know, the the, the American dream uh, that everyone wants to uh, live, wants to you know, aspires to be a success. Uh, you know, thank God there's a lot of opportunities in the world, but America 
has always, uh, you know, at least for these last couple of hundred years, has monopolized the market on an American dream. And uh, so going from nothing to something, uh, so anyone that's trying to build something up will get connected to that part of the story. Uh, the next part of the story talks about of how having everything, but at the same time feeling like you have nothing, uh, which is a part of the story that uh, a lot of people that have already made it in life uh, can, uh, can connect to because sometimes you can have all the material in the world, but you still feel a, sen you know, a certain uh, sense of emptiness. Uh, and that's where I got to. And by having success, you know, most people say, oh, yeah, listen, the guy made $100,000, $200,000 a year. He's successful. He has a nice house. He has a nice car. No, that's not what I mean. The type of success that we're talking about is on a bad month, making $200,000 or $300,000. Uh, you know, on a good month, wow. a million and a half dollars. You know, millions and millions of dollars, success, fame, you know, being on television, uh, having a firm with a bunch of, uh, you know, uh, educated people working for me. They're much older than me. I'm the youngest guy in the, in the room, but yet they're all working for me. You know, all, you know, all the things that people see on TV uh, that usually uh, actors or uh, athletes have, uh, I had as a young guy. And um, pretty much anything and everything that someone would want to have material we had the ability to have it if either we had it or we had the ability to have it. Uh, even though, interestingly, interestingly enough, I was never really materialistic. I liked money as far as making it, but as far as having it, it was a little bit, it was quite a bit of a headache because, you know, a lot comes with it. Uh, so that part of it, a lot of people connect to. Uh, but the next part, which is my favorite part, is when the boss upstairs knocks on your door and he says, Hello. I'm here. Uh, so you haven't pay paid attention to me, so I just wanted to let you know that uh, I'm running the show, and from now on, I'm going to show you a few more things. <laughs> and you start, <laughs> and you start seeing Hashem, uh, you know, God as we know Him, you know, the one and only God of Israel, run the show. And uh, it was, if it was a miracle to make the money, going from literally nothing, you know, being at one point in my life thirty-five dollars away from being homeless, to making millions of dollars. And having a firm and a hedge fund and a brokerage firm and an insurance company and all types of wonderful things in the business world, if that was a miracle, the losing everything uh, was 10 miracles. Because even if you tried to lose that kind of money and to make that many mistakes and to have everything and anything that could go wrong go wrong, you still wouldn't do it. It's, it, was, it was literally much more of a miracle going down than it was going up. Uh, but alongside the, the money loss was a 26-year-old, perfectly healthy person one day and a few hours later turning into the sickest person you could possibly imagine that everyone says is dying, you know, on any given day. Right. Mainly from stress, uh, I guess. Right? And uh, having a, a simple surgery that I didn't even need to have, hmm. uh, an elective surgery, one of those surgeries where it's just annoying. It's uh, similar to, let's say, for example, somebody wanting to have a LASIK surgery because they don't feel like wearing glasses anymore, so they have a laser surgery to fix their eyes. Or someone that wants to remove, I don't know, some type of uh, piece of skin that he has. You know, an elective surgery, something you literally do not need to have in me. Annoy you, bother you, I don't know, once in a while, but mamash, a, a really uh, a surgery, uh, you know, that two out of three people have this. It's called hemorrhoids. Uh, and it's, so I, I usually don't start with it simply because right. Most people get worried when I say, it, like, oh, maybe I have it. No, you don't have it. This was, like I said, all the hand of Hashem uh, getting involved, uh, having a surgery where the doctor was an expert, you know, almost 20 years in the business, very well known, and obviously having money, I didn't worry about uh, getting an expert. And uh, he told me, listen, you're probably going to feel uncomfortable for a couple of days, but uh, on Monday, you're back to work, which was really my only concern. When am I going back to work? Uh, and uh, having a surgery in the morning and waking up out of the surgery a completely different person, different body, body that's in pain and pretty much fighting for my life for the next seven years. Wow. Because uh, everything, my whole body started failing and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll go into more details uh, either later on or we also go into it in uh, some of the, um, uh, the longer video. But uh, again, so you go from poverty to wealth and then Hashem runs the show takes everything away from you and your everything that you thought you had you now don't have 
uh, and um, you're in a position where you're forced to do something about it. Uh, and uh, that's where God comes in. And usually, that's why I tell people all the time where, you know, my lectures are um, mostly about Musar. Mostly, even though we talk about parasha, we talk about, you know, obviously all parts of the Torah. Right. I use, you know, sources as often as possible. Um, but uh, if you pay attention to the way that I speak versus the traditional English-speaking rabbi, I'm a lot more harsh, and uh, you could call it, where I could tell you, I'll tell you how it is. You know, I don't sugarcoat, I don't uh, delete parts of the Torah because uh, it's not convenient to hear, even if it's parts that are difficult to hear, like, for example, the parts about the curses that are in the Torah, where Hashem told us that, you know, there's different levels of curses where if we continuously sin, uh, we could even get to a point of uh, such starvation where we'd eat our own children. Wow. Uh, right. This is actually literally written in the Torah oh. in a couple of places. Um, both in Parashat Bechukotai and Parashat Kitavo. Uh, and um, most Jews don't even know these parts exist simply because, you know, they don't speak the holy language. They speak Hebrew, which is modern Hebrew, but not the holy language. Right. Or they just didn't pay attention. Uh, and um, really, most people just think, oh, maybe it's an exaggeration. Maybe it's a uh, some type of, uh, you know, analogy of something. No, no, no. This actually happened multiple times throughout history and we did a lecture about a year ago uh, about the Holocaust and um, which uh, is hard for everyone to talk about myself included but we still have to bring out the facts and the point of me bringing the Holocaust up was not to remind ourselves of a sad memory of six million holy souls uh, being murdered and many many other people uh, obviously also murdered along with them tens of millions of other people millions uh, that were not Jews uh, murdered around the world um, it's not about that it was about the fact that this was all already written that it will happen in the Torah by the one and only that you know created that could actually know that this would happen this was promised this was prophesied and um, so one of the things that actually happened during the Holocaust was this very disturbing prophecy of actually eating children uh, obviously not intentionally and so on so anyone that wants to watch it there's a whole lecture I have about the Holocaust uh, there's even a movie that we made about it but the point being is that I bring out the inconvenient facts the things that no one really wants to talk about no one wants to hear sure. uh, simply because I know that we need to hear it because if we didn't then God wouldn't write it that you know sense, if it was yeah. supposed yeah. to be some type of secret then we wouldn't write it. He wouldn't write it in, in you know, the written Torah. And uh, and the reason why this is one of the main things that is uh, attractive to me, uh, not necessarily just disturbing parts, just in general, the stuff that uh, is politically incorrect, is uh, because I know that had I known this, it would have made a difference. I can't tell you that I would have done tshuva earlier. I can't tell you that I would have become anything. I would have changed my life or anything like that. But one thing I can tell you for sure is that when you have information, you make different decisions than when you don't have information. So when I had rabbis come to my office two or three times a week, uh, you know, once in a while, you know, they would uh, tell us something about the weekly parasha. Uh, you know, we'd give them tzedakah as often as they came. And it was, you know, it was an open door policy. I've always respected religion. I've respected Judaism. I was born Jewish. I was born in Israel, and uh, moved to the United States when I was ten years old, and uh, you know, lived in a uh, traditional home, if you could call it, where we, you know, we kept certain mitzvot that were convenient to us, but there were certain mitzvot that weren't that we didn't. Uh, so, for example, if uh, Kosher food was easy enough to get, we'd eat it. If it wasn't, we won't. If uh, a holiday was uh, something that we thought was important, like, for example, like Passover or Yom Kippur, we'd observe it. But a day like Shabbat, the Sabbath, which we didn't think was really such a big deal, even though it's one of the Ten Commandments, uh, we just think it, we thought it was optional, so we didn't keep it. Right. So, you know, it's again, it's as a, as a result of ignorance, you make... Uh, Foolish decisions, uh, but nonetheless, when no one, the people that know, don't tell you, when no one tells you, you're going to continue making those decisions. Uh, so that's why that's the stuff that I try to bring to light 
um, because um, I know that if peop when people find out about this, it's much easier to understand why certain things in life happen, why, uh, why life is the way it is. There's actually answers in the Torah. You just have to look. Um, and uh, Baruch Hashem, we had the merit to, lear, you know, to learn it, even though my uh, journey was a little bit more difficult than uh, I wish for anybody to have, even my enemies. Sure, sure. Uh, it's, it's still, uh, it was a necessary journey. I think, I think uh, a lot of people might agree that uh, in, in situations, I mean, there's a handful of different type of stressful situations that someone would never want to encounter. One of them would be, you know, heartbreak from a marriage or, you know, a loss of a loved one. Uh, or money, or loss of a sure. child. So all those individual things, and um, and so for me, I think uh, you know I've been been married for 17 years now, Baruch Hashem, <clears throat> and uh, but I've never really had we've never really had money, not not even to a, an nth degree of the scale that you've encountered, uh, and I think that if I had, and then I had that that change. Um, that such dramatic change uh, from those funds, I think that might just make, send me into a panic attack and have a heart attack and die from it. I don't know, but I know that's just very that would stress me out big time. I'm pretty sure. So yeah, no, it's it's not know. it's not an easy transition. I mean, you know, right. it's a uh, going from nothing to something is definitely a major uh, you know uh, high. You know, all of a sudden you can buy whatever you want. You don't have to worry about. You know the electric being turned off. You don't have right. to worry about borrowing money so you could eat. I mean, it's it's a major change. And usually, when someone gets rich when they're young, uh, you know they tend to make you know a lot of mistakes. But you know because I was in the financial services business, uh, you know my profession was fine managing money. Uh, I didn't make those common mistakes like many people do, which you know buy fancy cars and planes and all that nonsense that people waste their life on. Right. Uh, I invested all of my money. Either in my profession, which was you know in my business, uh, or I invested it into the stock market, which is what I did for a living. Right. Uh, right. So I invested everything into it, and it was so. It, and I lost it exactly where I invested it. It's not <laughs> like I. Uh, it's not like I, uh, you know, um, invested it into uh, some new idea that never existed. I the same way I made it is the same way that I invested it. The same way that it grew is the same way it disappeared. Right. Uh, right. And. Um, the interesting part is that losing it, by the time I actually lost uh, a lot of the money or all of it, uh, I knew probably a hundred times more than I did when I made it. So it wasn't necessarily a lack of knowledge or anything like that. It was literally, if you know the details of what happened, and you know, it took a while to lose, it wasn't like one day, um, it's literally had to be a hand of God involved because it wasn't just one thing that went wrong. It was everything and anything that could go wrong went wrong. Went wrong. Right. Uh, and um, that's funny. You know, and this is you know friends that you know were my employees turned to enemies, started stealing from me. Uh, I mean, everything that went wrong, everything just went wrong. It's just it was just bad. And uh, yes, I did want to die. Um, you know, because aside from having the stress of losing money, which, you know, you're used to being a winner and now all of a sudden you're a loser and it's not just your money, it's also other people's money, you know, so losing other people's money was much more difficult for me than losing my own money because sure, my own sure. money, uh, I always had confidence that I'll be able to make it again. Um, and even though I wasn't religious, I had, you know, I believe that God gave it to me and I believe that God took it. It was never really a, uh, an issue of belief in God, it's just lack of knowledge of what he wants for me. Right, right. Uh, but losing other people's money was very difficult uh, because I was used to making the money. For years, I was making the money on everything we touched turned to gold. Uh, so now losing was very difficult. I uh, started getting, you know, nervous breakdowns at times and, and really just uh, you start losing your mind. But that wasn't the most difficult part. The most difficult part was enduring all of that when I was in pain, physical pain, mm -hmm. 24 hours a day. Uh, I would have to go to a doctor two to three times a week. Uh, we went to more than 50 different types of doctors uh, from holistic medicine to traditional medicine, from the best of the best to the average guy, everything and anything you could possibly imagine. Uh, we tried steroids like athletes do, which acupuncture, I even got to a point where I became a uh, part of a study for ozone treatment, where they would actually inject me with ozone, oh, which man. is 
you know, uh, air pretty much, mm. just purified air, purified oxygen, uh, to try to purify my blood several times a week. And for anyone who didn't try it, I don't know how it feels for anybody else, but for me, it felt like I was dying. Wow. Like, it felt like wow. I had, uh, it was, I was literally, like after the treatment, I would feel like I was, I got like some type of cancer treatment or something. It felt right, like I was right. dying for a while. And, but in hopes that this is going to work mm. out, and I did this for some time. Uh, so literally trying everything and pretty much living on painkillers. And no, I didn't get high because when you actually have pain, you don't get the high. Uh, you know, and um, just uh, really just a shock. Like my whole life turned upside down in one day. Mm. November 18th, 2006. I was a couple of months after I had my biggest month of my career. I made one point six million dollars in a month. <laughs> I, you know, wow. it was a fantastic. I went to I went on vacation to Las Vegas for a month, and uh, you know, played in the World Series of Poker and a bunch of other tournaments. I used to be a high stakes poker player, um, and played with some of the uh, you know best players in the world. And you know, it was uh, because I had a lot of money, it was very difficult to play against me simply because I wasn't scared of losing. Right, right. Um, <laughs> plus, I was a math guy, so that kind of helped. Um, and uh, so I just made a bunch of money. I had a vacation. I was with the love of my life, uh, which uh, we get into the details of that in the story also, who actually was not Jewish uh, and at the time. And uh, everything was great. Everything was fantastic, uh, and I had more money than I knew what to do with. Out of uh, you know, everything was going in the right direction. Even though there were certain things that weren't perfect, everything was going in the right direction. Uh, I was only 26 years old, and I already had more than enough money and more than you know most okay. people would wish for. And then I decided, you know what? Let me take advantage and uh, have a surgery. That will just annoy me for a couple of days, but will solve a problem that won't annoy me even, you know, any time in my life. So on November 18th of 2006, just a few months after I had that biggest month and everything was fantastic, I had the surgery and um, woke up out of the surgery screaming my lungs out, asking everyone to kill me. No one would listen. Wow. Uh, they continued giving me uh, morphine, and then we discovered I never took drugs in my life. So um, since I liked my brain. And uh, I uh, discovered something interesting about my body, which was that it rejects most medicine. Oh, wow. So my body was not uh, accepting the morphine. It didn't work. Hmm. So they just continued giving me more and more and more and more. The most, and then they eventually got to a point where they gave me the most amount of legally allowed morphine, which eventually calmed me down. Uh, now, throughout all of this time, which seemed like an eternity, but I don't know, I guess it was less, uh, it was the type of pain where it was um, like taking a knife, like one of those really big, scary daggers they have in the movies, right. or like hunters have, and just cutting some, you know, cutting your body up over and over and over again and never stopping. And by the way, it's also <clears throat> attached to electricity. Oh, boy. Wow. So it was hell. It was, you know, so when people ask me, oh, do you know anything about hell? I'm like, yeah, I saw it. <laughs> you experienced it firsthand, <laughs> basically. Right, right. Uh, right. So, and that, so that, my body calmed down, and I thought everything was fine, and, you know, the doctors were excited to release me, because, again, after all, this was all an elective surgery. You're not supposed to stay at the hospital right. for uh, 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 hemorrhoid surgery. So I said, no, listen, this was just a hiccup. You're fine now. You're calm. Go home. I said, okay, Great. Went home. On the way home, we picked up a sandwich of shawarma, got home, and thought that, okay, guys, this was a very interesting day. Thank you for <laughs> thank you for coming. I'm going to sleep and, you know, expecting a better tomorrow. Uh, little did I know that after I closed my eyes, I would wake up 40 minutes later, and I would actually have worse pain than I did a few hours earlier. Oh, boy. Only this, only this time, it didn't stop for 62 days. I can't even. I can't just, even wrap my head around that. Yeah. That's just. It didn't stop. Yeah, I uh, actually thinking about it now. I mean, it's been over hmm. ten years now. Uh, it's hard for me to even think about it, but it didn't stop. The pain did not stop uh, for more than fifteen minutes at a time for sixty-two days, um, and uh, I mean, my body started failing. I started bleeding from my eyes, my ears, 
uh, started urinating blood. I mean, everything just went wrong. Everything. The doctor said, you know, we have no idea why it's happening. This has never happened in the history of medicine that we know of. Uh, like this was everything that's happening to him is not related. Hmm. It's a complete, completely different body parts are failing. You know, so, you know, we had a surgery and a rectum. What does that have to do with his legs? What does that have to do with his eyes? What does that have to do with his ears? What does that have to do with his chest? What does that have to do with his liver? It has right. nothing to do with it. Right. It's, I mean, basically, uh, you know, a superficial surgery. It has nothing to do with anything. Hmm. Um, except that the same guy that <laughs> gave me the body is also the same guy that managed the surgery. Uh, so uh, everything went wrong. And um, after about two months, a little over two months, uh, the pain started subsiding to some extent, and you know, I was able to just manage life with you know just a bunch of painkillers, and uh, started going back to you know myself, like little you know, still dealt with a lot of pain, but nowhere near where it was for those couple of months, and uh, um, but again, you know, thought that I just had a, another chance at life. Uh, so, um, went back to, went to, back to work and, uh, little by little was getting better. At least that's what I thought until about nine months later, uh, I got a pain in the back of my leg, uh, close to where the surgery was, but not the same body part. Um, and I just thought I was just pulled a muscle, a hamstring or something. I didn't really think much of it except that I woke up the next day, not being able to walk in an immense pain, emergency room. They told me that I had an abscess, which is an internal infection, connecting the muscle of the leg to the rectum, which is, you know, they said how it got there and how you have a surgery. We have no idea. All we know is that it's so big and it's so dangerous that if you would have waited a couple of hours, it would have exploded, got into your blood system, you would have died instantly. Oh, my. Wow. So it's not like your, you know, infection that you have in your finger and you just put some bacitration on it and everything's okay. You know, it's a... Infection where you have to go to emergency room, they cut you up, and you have to stay in the intensive care unit for a couple of weeks uh, because they have to keep the whole thing open. They can't even stitch it up because they have to continuously open it every day. So that was a lot of fun. Uh, so how long were you? How much overall time did you spend in the hospital throughout these, uh, throughout each one of seven. these sickness stages? Do you roughly uh, any rough rough idea? I mean. <laughs> Average. I mean, after that that first surgery, I was there for a couple of weeks, and pretty much every time I would go to the hospital, I would have to be there for you know, usually about a you know four or five days to two and a half weeks. So over a span of how long do you think? Over over seven years. Oh, seven years. Um, gotcha. I mean, I uh, <clears throat> I went to me. many many doctors, many surgeries, many hospitals. Uh, I can't. I don't. Honestly, I don't know. I all I okay. know is that. My medical file is about six feet thick. <laughs> so you, so you, you started this downfall in around two thousand and six. Yes. Okay, and that was and at, at your financial downfall started first, and then your body started failing. Uh, but you mentioned something that I find is going to be a very, very important part of today's show, and that is the love of your life, because yes. uh, part of your testimony that makes it so like amazing in my opinion is you have your own testimony but you also have a testimony of your wife who was not Jewish and who had to go through the struggles of you rejecting her Messiah and things of that nature and she and you had to go with the struggles of her uh, wondering whether she was going to leave because of all the troubles you're having when did you meet her was it before 2006 or after oh it was before How we, uh, we actually met in uh, we met in 2004 Okay. Uh, and um, so she knew you in the high point, times. Yes. So oh. she knew me when I was pretty much getting on the big wave already. Wow. I just became a millionaire, uh, you know. But I was still my first million, and uh, she was working for a company that I was doing business with, and uh, she was actually trying to leave Wall Street at the time. Uh, but uh, since I was uh, the company that she was working with, I was about 40% of their total revenues were coming from me directly. Oh, man. They had 350 people, but 40% was coming from one person. Hmm. So they had to do whatever they could to make me happy. And so the people that they had servicing my account, if you will, were not cutting it. So she was the best in the business. So even though she was trying to leave, they said, listen, do us a favor. 
and just help him for a little while until we find a replacement because everyone else is either quitting or we're firing them. They're just not doing it. They're, you know, he's doing, you know, multi-million dollar trades and they're screwing up and it's costing us, you know, a ton of money. So just make him happy. Do what you got to do. So she started uh, helping me and we became friends on the phone. She was in Florida. I was in New York. Nice. Again, both of us living completely separate lives. But, but again, when you spend a lot of time on the phone with somebody uh, doing business, eventually you become friendly. Now, I thought that she was, you know, charming, amazing, very, very smart. I right away understood she was the best in the business because she was just doing things that were uh, impossible uh, as far as the business is concerned. So I respected her a lot for the business. But as far as like on a personal scale, I didn't know what she looked like. So I thought she's probably, I don't know, five, six, seven hundred pounds. <laughs> and uh, she was <laughs> she was wheeled into the uh, into the office to help this uh, this guy from New York. Like, I didn't know anything. Right, right. All I knew is that she was just this charming, amazing person. But that's it. But anyway, we became friends over the phone. And uh, one day they had a conference, uh, which they invited. The company had a conference. They invited me to uh, in 2004. And they had her be my tour guide. Like to show me around because we're already friendly for, I don't know, maybe six months or uh, maybe close to a year even at that point. But I've, again, we never I've never seen her before at that point. So I went there and I saw this beautiful, amazing woman that was uh, I'm like, this can't be. And it was. So for me, it was like, wow, this is unbelievable. But the problem was both of us were in relationships. So oh, there was nothing to be. Oh, there was nothing right. to happen. There was just, uh, you know, still she was beautiful and great, but that's it. Uh, and I thought that was where it would end. Plus, she's in Florida. I'm in New York. Right. Nothing could be more different. Um, and even though I wasn't religious, I've always planned on marrying a Jew. So uh, she wasn't Jewish. So I said, hey, this, this is the furthest thing from reality. Little did I know that, uh, again, Hashem has different plans. Uh, so he just you know, laughs at us when we try to make our own plans. <laughs> sure. And, uh, and, uh, so anyway, so we, uh, became friendly and then, uh, after that trip, after we met each other, became a little more friendly. We ended up starting to, uh, you know, leaving our significant others, if you will, uh, that we were extremely unhappy with even before that, you know, before we met each other, that's actually part of what we talked about most of the time about how unhappy we were with who we were with. Uh, and uh, we started dating, but again, long distance. Right, right. Uh, but, you know, so she would come to New York once in a while, would go to Florida, and, you know, it was great, but it was not a real relationship as far as what I thought it was going to be. And, uh, but then one thing led to another. We fell in love, and we decided, okay, this has to go somewhere. The problem is that, again, I'm still Jewish. So even though I'm not religious, I, I definitely don't believe in J.C. Penney. <laughs> I don't believe in Jesus. Right. Uh, I've always Sorry. found it uh, to be foolish. Even as a kid, you know, I would have debates with my non-Jewish friends because I went to public school, and I would just tell them, like, "You really believe that story that some guy was born out of nothing and he's really God at the same time?" It just never made sense to me. And again, I wasn't educated about Torah; just the story never added up, and no one was able to answer questions. Uh, and I would just, you know, would just jab at each other. They would make fun of Judaism. I would make fun of Christianity. I, you know, that's what kids do. So, again, I, I didn't know a lot, but I knew that the story itself didn't make sense. And um, she, on the other hand, actually grew up in a semi-religious home. And interestingly enough, she actually wanted me to become a religious Jew. Oh, not a Christian. Not that she was Catholic, right? No, she was Christian. Oh, she was okay. And she want she was Christian. But she, and she was very, very well learned okay. uh, in Christianity, but she, like many Christians that I've met since, have pretty much created our own religion. And right. that's one of the things that I actually found out later on is that I don't think there's two Christians that believe the same thing. Most of them just right. take what they want from the New Testament and pretty much make their own religion up and call it Christianity. Right. They call it, you know, Lutheran and this one and that one. But in reality, it's their own version. Everyone has their own version of Christianity because one guy says it's the Messiah. The other one says it's God. The other one says maybe it's a mix. The other one says it's a tzaddik. It's a prophet. It's a, everyone has a different version of the story. No one actually believes the New Testament for what it is. I guess maybe that's the reason why there's 200,000 versions of it. Right. Um, and But needless to say, it was very interesting for me that this woman that I fell in love with, 
actually doesn't want me to be Christian. She actually wants me to not only be Jewish, but she wants me to be a religious Jew. She wants me to start learning Torah. So she brought, bought me my first Tanakh, but the Hebrew version. Uh, so she didn't buy me like a New Testament with the New Testament. She never, ever introduced, you never told me about the New Testament, never talked about it. We'd actually uh, um, have jokes about it. I would call it the remix. I'll call the New Testament the remix. And, uh, you know, and uh, I told them, you know, why would you, you know, go with the remix? Why don't you go with the original? You know, the, the original is always a classic. And we'd laugh about it. But again, we decided early on that uh, religion was not going to separate us. You know, if God wanted you to be Jewish, you'd be Jewish. If God wanted me to be Christian, I'd be Christian. We both believe in God, the same God. We don't believe in some guy. Uh, we just believe that God is who he is. And that's it. And um, this, whatever you believe that some guy died and he's the Mashiach or he's this or he's that, I don't know. I think it's foolish, but it has nothing to do with anything in our life. We're living life in a different direction. We're not overly religious. So what we did is we'd actually observe the Jewish holidays that I was observing my whole life. We'd keep kosher. You know, I kept Passover, I kept Yom Kippur, uh, you know, some of the, the big holidays I would keep. And she'd keep them with me. She actually come to the synagogue with me. Uh, she would um, encourage me to give more and more tzedakah. And that's it. It's like it was never really a issue. Um, so, but the problem started is that in 2006, we got married. We got married civilly. We never had like a big celebration or a big party, even though we had all the money in the world. Uh, we knew that both families had a problem with the issue. Obviously, we can't get married in a Jewish wedding because she's not Jewish. And I'm definitely not going into a church. Um, so we're just not going to have a wedding. We're going to have a civil wedding. We're going to go to the court, get married, and live happily ever after. And if we want to go on a honeymoon, we can just do that every week. We don't have to do it once in a lifetime. Uh, so that's what we did. We just went to the court, you know, got a couple of friends to come with us to be witnesses, right. got married, and that's it. Everything just stayed as is. And um, she was never – she was interested in helping me. She was interested in, you know, helping me build my business, and she, she we started a new business together, and uh, she, took, she helped me take the business to the next level. But she was never really materialistic. She was just, you know, we just were business people. We're very successful, very professional. Um, and um, we did whatever we could to help everyone around us. Uh, and that's why I said, you know, as far as having money, I was never really into buying stuff. I was really more into, you know, making it because most of the money that I had that wasn't invested in the business was given to other people to help them, help them with their business, help them pay the rent, help them with whatever charity they had. Right. Um, uh, I liked giving it, you know, it was, uh, I guess, you know, God created me in a, I guess in an interesting way where I just never really valued money. Uh, to me, it's a tool to me. It's I don't know, the same thing. You look at, let's say a hammer. I look at money. Nice. You're never going to worship a hammer. Right. Even if you think the hammer is the greatest hammer that was ever created, you're still never going to worship it. You're still never going to lose sleep over it. You're never going to think about whether you should lend it to somebody or not. It's a hammer after all, and it's replaceable. That's the way I've always looked at money. It's replaceable. It's paper. Um, so that helped me. It helped me make it because I wasn't afraid to ask for a lot of money if I was doing a deal with somebody. Right. Um, and at the same token, it also helped me you know, keep my head uh, after having it and not start to do drugs and all types you – know, prostitutions and all that stupid things that people do um and anyway so i had my i had the relationship that was the best relationship in the world so she wasn't really materialistic and i you know we both like building something special and we try to help a lot of people and everything was going great so then after the surgery um i was you know pretty much certain that she was going to leave because if i was her i would have left I mean, there was no reason in the world for you to stay with someone that's constantly sick, in pain, 24 hours a day, screaming, yelling, cursing the day he was born. Um, pretty much, my I would ask her to kill me on a day-to-day -day basis, literally. Right. Uh, and uh, obviously, she didn't listen. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, I honestly, I never understood why she stuck around. 
until later on, but it's a at that point I just didn't understand it. I didn't get it. I told her, "Listen, you're still you're, you're a young girl. You're you got the world in your hands. I mean, why? No, I don't want to ruin your life. I mean, I'm gonna be like this. I mean, I, you know, I thought initially I was gonna get healthy. After a few months, I thought I was gonna get healthy. But then after the first surgery, I realized, okay, maybe this is not gonna be as easy as I thought because it just got worse. And then after it can, you know, a few months later it was another surgery, and a few months later it was another surgery, and it just continued becoming worse and worse. Eventually, it just got to a point where after a few years of just nothing, it just getting worse, my body getting worse. Uh, mm. I got to a point where I just said, it's, it's it's not getting better. You should leave. You should go on with the rest of your life. You should do something else. Like, don't feel bad. It's okay. I understand. I wouldn't stay with me. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the most amazing thing uh, that anyone's ever told me or I think anyone's ever said is that she said, listen, our, our whole life was literally revolved around making me happy. And if making me happy had to be done when I was sick, then so be it. So you have this wow. unusual relationship and the person that's supposed to pretty much you know, look for the next door to run out is actually, you know, saying that there's no chance in the world that she's leaving. Uh, And it's not even a thought. It's not even an option. And so you don't even know what to do with yourself at that point. Right. Man. So now it's like part of you wants to live because you don't want to make them upset. The other part wants to die because you're tired of pain. Um, So uh, after a few years of of going through this, you know, this... You know, uh, I guess real life version of Ganome, um, and you know, going to over fifty doctors and uh, constantly, you know, seeing one failure after another. Um, I got to a point where I said, "Okay, you know what? I don't want to ruin her life." I I thought I was going to commit suicide, and uh, I said, "You know, it's not even just that I don't want to live; it's I don't want to ruin her life." Right. Um, cause again, we're still, we're still very young. We're still got a whole life ahead of us. Why, why ruin it? Um, uh, we're just being surrounded by this sick guy. Um, and, uh, so I started thinking about, it. I started planning it, started thinking, what am I going to do? And this again, I still had a bunch of money. I was losing, but I still had, you had a lot to lose. Uh, so, um, it wasn't about money. It was just purely about not wanting to be in pain anymore. Cause you know, when you're in pain, nothing means anything. You know, it's like all the material in the world means absolutely nothing. So I had, you know, breaks in between. So for, you know, a couple of months, I would feel like somewhat okay. You know, I'd only have to take, you know, maybe five or ten painkillers a day and have a decent life versus other times where I would have to be in and out of hospitals. So I would have breaks. And during those breaks, it would, you know, we'd have as much fun as possible. We'd go to the casino. We'd go on some vacation. We'd just hang out and watch movies. So we'd have fun during that time. But that was like small increments of time amongst the, you know, that would make life worth it. But when it got bad, it got really, really bad. So I, during those times I started thinking about, okay, this is, this, this has to end. And, um, one of the things that the sages teach us, uh, is that Hashem is not going to give you a test that you can't pass. Meaning everything that you're dealing with, now, yesterday, tomorrow, whenever. It means that Hashem knows you can pass this test. However difficult it is, however impossible it seems, you can pass it. There's a reason you got it, and the reason why you got it is because you can pass it. Somebody else may not be able to pass it. Right. But you, Hashem created you in a way that you can pass that test. And as soon as it gets to a point where you can't pass that test, he says, if you look for me, you'll find me. Hmm. And it's in the uh, chapter 4 of the book of Deuteronomy. It talks about the end of days. It talks about Ami Sayyid sinning and going to false gods, um, which if you look through Torah codes, uh, you see that the false gods that it's referring to is Christianity and Islam. Uh, but uh, either way, one of the things it says in, the, um, in verse 29 in chapter 4 is that from there you will seek Hashem, your God, and you will find Him. If you search for Him with all of your heart and all of your soul. And this is a specific promise from Hashem, where if you look for Him, 
you'll find them. But he doesn't say if you just look <clears> for him, like, you know, you look for keys. Like, if you look for him with all of your heart and all of your soul, you'll find him. It has to be, you have to exert an extraordinary amount of effort. You have to be willing to face the inconvenient truth. You have to do things that you don't feel like doing, that you don't want to doing, you don't want to do. You have to make yourself uncomfortable. Like anything in life, if you want to succeed in anything in life, you have to be willing to become uncomfortable. Right. right. And this is, this is one of the things that most people don't want to do, especially today, uh, which is the reason why many people stay average, is because they're not willing to do something that is going to make them uncomfortable. They're not willing to take a certain risk financially. They're not willing to take a certain risk relationship-wise. They're not willing to take a certain risk with, let's say, their beliefs and faith and so on. People like to be comfortable yep right um so and in america it's even more so which is the reason why america doesn't really manufacture anything anymore we just are a, the number one producer of convenience we're a servicing business as a, you know as a people that's that's what americans do we provide convenience so they provide you a convenient way to socialize with people across the world so they created facebook and twitter and all the social networks uh, and uh, all types of the we provide services in America to make life convenient because it fits the mentality that sure, we have. Sure. So when you tell somebody, listen, in order for you to get to the answer, you're going to have to pretty much admit that everything you know could very well be false. Your whole life is a lie. Right. And that's where I got to. And so. Uh, uh, oh, yeah. As we're, we're we're kind of running out of time, but I want I wanted to kind of sure. close up also. Uh, now that we're kind of at that point, um, just kind of give us a quick summary on how how you and your wife finally came to terms spiritually and how heavy of a struggle it was for you. So at that point, to uh, we had to start realizing. Okay, so obviously God, the same God we both believe in, is not happy. So. Through a series of different miracles, I, got, I was introduced to uh, my cousin who ended up being my rabbi, Rabbi, rabbi Ephraim Kachlon, and then later on to Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi. And also along the way, I also started studying uh, the work of Rabbi Tovia Singer and Rabbi uh, Zamir Cohen. Uh, and the reason why all of these different rabbis came along is because we both started trying to figure out, okay, what does God actually want here? Uh, but aside from that, I... Uh, started realizing that the situation that we're in is not good. She's Christian. I'm, I'm, I'm a Jew. It's something's not good. Something is, 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 doesn't work because I wanted to have kids at some point. How, what do we raise them? A Jew, a Christian, how? And so in essence, what I ended up doing is that I ended up becoming uh, a little bit obsessed with, with uh, discovering the truth. But my goal was actually to see whether the Torah was real or not, first of all. Uh, after that, after figuring out that it's 100% real, I always thought that the New Testament was real. I just thought it was second best. Gotcha. There were some mistakes, and I just thought it was second best. I never thought it was outright fake. I never thought it was man-made fake, falsehood. I never thought any of that. I just thought it was like, I don't know, second best. I don't know, some, for the rest of the world, maybe, not for Jews. So then I started saying, okay, listen, so can she convert? Why would she convert? Because she believes, like, I'm not going to make her convert into something I'm not keeping myself. Right. So then I started studying it, and first rabbi I actually went across was Rabbi Tobia Singer. And um, I started realizing that there's something wrong with it. Now, I tried introducing Rabbi Tobia Singer's uh, videos to her, but she said he spoke too fast. <laughs> so I said, okay, all right, so let's, uh, let's, let's try somebody else. That's funny. So then I uh, saw the debate by Rabbi uh, Yosef Mizrahi, and that, well, after I saw that debate first by myself, that's when I officially realized that it's not a problem. It's fake. Like the whole thing, the whole New Testament is outright fake. It's just a man-made story. And there's a million and a half things wrong with it that I already heard from Rabbi Tobia Singer. But for whatever reason or another, the, the, the debate by Rabbi Mizrahi put the nail in the coffin where it pretty much made me realize that now it's not a situation of whether I, she wants to convert or not. It's not a situation of whether she believes or not. It's a situation where right now I'm trying to save her soul. Right. I no longer care about getting married or, or, or a religion or anything. Now I just want to save the love of my life from – 
practicing idol worship for the rest of her life and being doomed. So nothing mattered at that point. Even my own sickness didn't matter anymore. I started pretty much nonstop studying and trying to provide her different proofs of how it's fake. And I tried having her watch the debate, which was uh, you know, an interesting story of its own. Um, and long story short, for months and months and months, I would pray and study. And we both got to a point of studying and praying to see what the truth is. And eventually, she saw she actually on her own, who had nothing to do with me, uh, started finding things that I never even looked for, that proved the New Testament wrong and the Torah right. Wow! And uh, eventually, she just told me, "Listen, it's 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 fake." I said, "Yes, I know it's fake." She goes, "No, why didn't you tell me it's fake?" I know I've been telling you it's fake for a while. She goes, "No, but it's real." Like she started like hysterical crying, like this is like. I lived a lie. Like, I don't have anything now. What do I do? Maybe, you know, she didn't even know that she can convert. She goes, maybe I'm not allowed to convert. So, again, having Rabbi Ephraim Kachlun along the way helped us a lot. But uh, long story short is that she eventually uh, ended up going to an Orthodox Bedin, uh, converting. We ended up to make sure that everything stayed 100% kosher. We actually had a chupa uh, that same day. So we're not living together Nice. Uh, as Jews, uh, you know, even for, you know, uh, unmarried for even a day. So we made sure that the same day of the conversion is the same day of the uh, chuppah, of the actual wedding. Uh, and um, that was, you know, the, uh, the the big, the biggest, the greatest day of my life. Wow. Uh, and, uh, I mean, obviously the story continues after. There's a lot sure, of sure. different details to it. But I think the biggest thing that I've learned personally from... The story that I think that all of the listeners, uh, whether they're Jews or they're Noahides or they're Christians with some doubts, uh, or even they're full-blown Christians with, uh, you know, trying to, you know, recruit Jews, God forbid. The reality of it is that anyone that is looking for the truth, really the truth, the real truth, not the like the truth, the convenient truth, the right. co- truth that the real convenient, the real truth. God said, you'll find it. That's you'll awesome. find it. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week. But if you look for it really, really hard, you will find it. Which means that as long as you have doubt, which everyone has, until they find Hashem, like the real version of Hashem, uh, as long as you have doubts, that means you haven't looked hard enough. So, And uh, once we got married and we found Hashem... Um, I little by little spent more and more time learning Torah, less and less work. Eventually, got to a point where I stopped working uh, and uh, decided to start uh, dedicate the rest of my life to teaching everyone and anyone that would be willing to listen. Even though it's a primary focus on Jews, I have Bo Hashem many many non-Jews uh, that uh, I teach either as Noahides or to help them convert. Uh, and uh, in so many words get people to the truth get them to the starting point right. because the, the truth is just a starting point it's not the finish it's not the finish line once you get to the truth that's when you can actually start living now that means that you could start potentially living at 60 years old but at least you're starting right right and so as it stands now you you seem to be perfectly healthy yeah, that's that's the amazing Ber- thing Ber- that Hashem. you know when uh, Bo Hashem is that uh, without any doctor's help from this world, yep. only from the doctor, one and only doctor above, the closer I got to Hashem, uh, the uh, better my body became. I started healing naturally without nice. any medicine, without anything, nice, uh, without exercise, without uh, nothing, just miracle after miracle. Uh, I just uh, got healthier. Yeah, I still have some issues here and there, but if you compare the old days to today, I mean, uh, I'd say I call it 99% better. Uh, you really can't compare the two. I mean, in the old sure. days, I wouldn't really be able to have a conversation with you for this long without, you know, screaming wow. a few times of pain. Oh, man. Thank you so, for that. Uh, Thank you for that. Yeah, so this is, it's, it's been one miracle after another, and this is why I'm so passionate about what I do is because not only did I see how it affected my marriage, my personal life, but I know that even though Hashem doesn't make the miracles like he did for us in Mount Sinai in the open, he still miracles them. are very much yes. alive and well. It's just personalized miracles for the people that 
have her yes. a merit to see a miracle for whatever reason. I had a merit, and yeah. Hashem has given me the uh, the miracle on a day to day basis. I think it's awesome that that uh, that your story, uh, including this this physical miracle of healing, as bad as you had it, um, you know, the closer you got to Torah and to Hashem and the truth of you know uh, there being one God. Uh, you know, your body just, your body started lining up on its own. And so, and same thing happened for me. There was something that I, there was like this, this rash that I had on my bottom that was like for years. I mean, like wow. seven, eight years after that, we literally, my wife and I researched different types of cream and all this other ointments and stuff. And finally I just, I gave up and I just thought, you know, what, that's it. I was, I was still a Christian in, in the messianic field there. And eventually I just, you know, I just gave up on it completely you know and then uh you know here we are on our journey out of the new testament and then uh all of a sudden i'm, I'm just i'm like looking down I'm like where'd it go it was there it was there for years and it wasn't until i started drawing closer to hashem through torah and torah only or tanakh only um that that's oh, that's when my body itself is sort of curing itself through hashem's power so i think it's amazing yeah, I mean, it's, it's it, listen. Hashem is 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 amazing. If we just let him right. in and no one else, that's right. why it's the first <clears throat> commandment. Right. Just let him in. Forget everyone else. He, that's the, actually the reason why he never told us where he buried Moses because he knew we'd idolize Moses. Oh my. Yeah. Uh, you I know, I mean, that. he knew he'd idolize him. I mean, he's the only one that ever spoke to God face to face and yeah. spoke to him like you and I are speaking. Right. Even closer. Uh, that's why he never told us where where he buried because he knew we'd ruin it. We'd ruin the history of Moses. We'd ruin everything. So he said, listen, just make sure if I'm if it's the best of the best, the prophet of all prophets, I don't want you to idolize him or I've even have him as a middleman between you and I. Obviously, I don't want you to have anybody else. Sure. Not a rabbi, not a Jesus, not Muhammad, not anyone. No one. Only you and I. Oh, that's all I want. And that's also the reason why each one of us is obligated to get that truth to people because People are constantly ruining it. They're ruining right. the first commandment. <clears throat> that relationship you're supposed to have with Hashem, it's a personal relationship. He told you, hey, you do this, you'll have eternity. You'll have the greatest of great. You'll have amazing, amazing things, maybe even in both worlds. But you'll definitely have eternity. But if you get anyone in between, it's the worst. Mm -hmm. That's why it's the first commandment. Don't get – I don't want your friends. I don't want some prophet. I don't want anyone. I don't want anything between us. It's just – I'm your creator. You're my child. That's it. Mm -hmm. That's all I want. And that's again, it's it's what you do is something that again I've always admired simply because what you're doing is you're fighting for the book of wars. Hashem in the uh, book of Numbers, uh, chapter 21, verse 14, he calls the Torah the book of wars, the wars of Hashem. What do you mean the wars of Hashem? Wars of Hashem meaning that Hashem is constantly fought for the truth to publicize his own truth. And we, as people, keep ruining it by th throwing other things into it, whether it be money right. or it be <clears throat> immodesty or it be other religions or other. Don't ruin it. It's the beginning. <laughs> just let it be. <laughs> and once you let it be, once you just let Hashem run the show and just start doing what he wants, right. everything changes. Everything changes. Even the problems, they don't necessarily just go away all the time. But even the problems, you start understanding why it's not really a problem, but rather it's a step right. to the next big thing. Right. There's a benefit out of the problem. There's something good that's going to come out of it. Everything is for the good. Uh, and that's what we learned from Rabbi Akiva, from our sages, that everything is for the good. That's what it means. It means that it's not that Hashem is just going to make your life you know, problemless. Right. Gonna, you right. have to have problems in order to achieve anything in life. You know, you have to have, you know, have to go up the, 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 the ladder in order to get to the top. And that ladder is not easy. It gets harder sure. and harder. Sure. But when you understand that there is a purpose for this problem, it no longer is, a, it's no longer viewed as a problem. It's viewed as one step closer to that creator. It's one step closer to Hashem. So Indeed. if we put something else in between us, we're ruining it. Right, right. Indeed. Be'ezrat Hashem is the website. For Rabbi Yaron Ruven, it's B E. It's on your screen. B E E Z R A T H A S H E M. I just did that all together because it's how it's spelled. <laughs> anyway, so and you also you also have a uh, Facebook page. I'll put that up on screen too. You'll find it the same way, um, and that is just simply type in. 
I don't know if it's like I've got it on here, scottfacebook.com forward slash Bezrath Hashem, but really you can just, just search Bezrath Hashem on the Facebook uh, search bar yeah. and you'll be able to find it that way. So either way, uh, you can find him there. Uh, so I think Rabbi and I are going to plan on doing uh, a few projects here in the That's upcoming sure. weeks. Uh, definitely a tour bar shift from time to time, maybe once every few months. Uh, and then uh, maybe maybe something else, a little special going on from here and there. So uh, um, I, I really hope you guys enjoyed it. Cause, and Rabbi... I really am I'm thankful for you to come on the show. It's, it's been a real pleasure for me, and it's been a long, My pleasure. long time waiting. And uh, it's I can't wait to get you here once again. It'll be it'll be good. For it's us. It's in God's help. Everything is with God's hand, and with Hashem, He's going to help us. Um, oh, so that's what that means. And Bezrat Hashem is is in God's hands. With God's help. With, with God's God. with God with God's help. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> I love learning new stuff. So thank you so much, Rabbi. Thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we'll see you guys next time on the other side. Shalom, shalom.